Hello. Um, I'm very sorry I couldn't be with you today, hence um, this recording. My name is Borba Lashosh. I'm a Hungarian but London-based curator. Um, where I'm currently undertaking an 18 months uh, curatorship at the Stanley Picker Gallery at Kingston University, London. So I often think about how in contemporary condition where many artists and arts professionals, including myself, keep moving countries, cities, or neighborhoods within a city, how we can establish meaningful connections with a specific site. In fact, when I introduce myself as a curator working with art and ecology, I often get asked if I'm working with a specific site or a long-term project. So in all honesty, um, I tell them that I don't have a site, I have many sites. I keep thinking about this sort of VD relationship as a journey, but there are temporary or not so temporary situations, often institutions that are in flux or biennials which emerged and disappeared, where temporary connections flourish and then change, but the seeds are carried to different new sites and situations. I feel like we are working in a constantly evolving ecosystem of cultural policy and institutional landscape, and hence developing resilient VD relationships is one way to sustain flourishing connections. Since I am talking to you on a recording, I will use this opportunity to take you on an imaginary journey and to try and free ourselves from the usual limitations of physical space if you like, an exhibition in the mind's eye. I will start guiding, with guiding you through an exhibition I curated um, at Lanzit Bratislava in 2020, titled Ecologies of a Ghost Landscape, A World for World is Forest. This journey, like many of my walks lately, will start actually in Nunhead Cemetery in Southeast London. For years, this place was my immediate um, neighborhood. With the help of artworks in the exhibition, we will examine specific entangled scenarios and habitats with complex political, social, and economic strings attached. I should perhaps start with a simple question. What is a forest? A forest is often defined in a dichotomy. A forest is that which is outside of the city walls, a place of the wild, the jungle, the place where capital, capitalist rules do not apply. The opposition of forest and city, much like the opposition of wilderness and control, have been long-standing paradigms that perpetuate a distancing between these systems and aid the exploitation of valuable resources. Even though that cities depend on forests in many ways, most obviously as a resource, we know that without a successful forest management, urban structures would not be able to survive. Yet, if we take another deposition, according to the United Nations, that looks at the density of tree cover and the crown coverage alone, London is actually a forest. The city is home to about 8 million trees. So there's roughly one for every person. In the middle of the urban jungle, the old Victorian Nunhead Cemetery is a very particular forest where the layers of human history, the dead and the living are quite literally entangled. To paraphrase Toby Hunnison, the author of Moomins and the fantastic poet as well. Throughout the summer, summer, nettles grow as high as possible, and where it stops, it is met with mulberries, elm, and alder branches that bend down and far under their age. Walking between them with your arms stretched out is like swimming. There are suffocating sweet scents from elderfrau and entropy, wild bird cherry and rowan, especially rowan smells like cat piss when they are in bloom. 
In hidden corners, there are all trees that stand witness to a much longer relationship, potentially predating the cemetery's function of the land. Like the old chestnut tree stump that has been coppiced, cut and allowed to regrow probably for centuries. As a result of this cooperation, such trees may never die as long as they are continually cut. A coppice tree is like this, as you see in the image, and also a symbol of resilience. So maybe it is not a coincidence um, that this print used to hang also at the Ophiennial's office at Summa Artium in Budapest. Office of Grassroots Organization, it's an alternative network for artists and curators, a biennial resisting the far-right government's cultural policy, and um, essentially it's been existing without government funding, and um, importantly, it advocates for a stronger um, civil society. But to return to the exhibition at transit, I wanted to talk a bit more about the initial idea and perhaps um, a third definition rooted in the of third definition of the forest rooted in the understanding that forest and culture have been interdependent since humans have um, interacted with it. Even the Amazon rainforest and other places you might think of as the deepest and the wild, a deepest wild have been in fact cultivated by groups of humans favoring certain plants and animals, developing internet relationships with them, including language and other forms of representation. Certain forms or assemblages of vegetation, as well as the quality of the soil, point at the existence of former villages. As Paolo Tavares puts it in his text, in the forest ruins for efflux, that we also read as part of the uh, online reading groups leading up to the exhibition at Transit. We know that the forest can be interpreted as a cultural artifact itself, says Paolo Tavares. Similarly to the forest and the city, the concept of the wild was created by the colonial imaginary to reject people and places outside of its system as other. The place where the wild things are represents the anti-hegemonic, where disorder and disobedience interrupt neat narratives, and where new kind of structures can arise. Hence, the idea of rewilding might contain the much needed political activist potential to recuperate not only multi-species scenarios and dynamic ecosystems, but also the anti-hegemonic uh, voices and various marginalized groups and individuals. In the exhibition at Transit, Ideas are about rewilding and renaturing propositions on the one hand, a visionary ecosystem management strategy, including the reintroduction of certain keystone species in a habitat depleted of biodiversity due to hum human interference. On the other hand, in an expanded social, political and activist sense, help to recuperate the voices of the so-called other. So rewilding is troubling in troubled times. The place where the wild things are is the anti-hegemonic, where disorder and disobedience interrupt these narratives. Rewilding can, at the same time, provide a framework to forefront the environment, the crisis, race, colonialism, and social structures that share entangled histories in Europe, including in Eastern Europe, and also beyond, and offer an approach where new planetary narratives can be told. From here on, I will just talk about um, some of the specific works included in the exhibition. So the next stop from London, we now go to France um, and slowly approaching um, um, so towards sort of um, the East. So, what we see here is a video by Hannah Roman and Faiza Ahmed Khan called Habitat 2090. The work follows the construction of the nature reserve called Fort Wet at the site of, former, of a former migrant camp. This migrant camp was dubbed the jungle in Calais, France. 
interrogating the justification for the site, a rare orchid called Lipsaris glossei, which was last spotted um, a couple of decades ago on the site. Um, the project addressed the ways in which an imagination of nature is recognized in governing borders. It complicates our relationship with nature, renaturing and rewilding. So basically what happened is that there was this migrant camp called the jungle and it's been um, declared a nature, nature reserve um, and as a nature reserve, it is a human exclusion zone and various structures have been built around it to protect this place, including removing um, 20 centimeters of the topsoil. So this orchid could, could potentially uh, flower again. Um, however, it is also a question who is and who is not welcome in a, in a site. Um, how are they, these places um, configured and imagined in their common, uh, communal imaginary. Hannah Roman and Ahmed Khan, Khan um, asked for uh, various pieces of paper that would uh, prove how much money the UK contributed towards this nature reserve that is um, also in France, but uh, the request was denied. Um, and the reason for that was that it would reveal too much um, about border control and national security, which is also in itself very revealing of how sort of the excuse of nature can be recognized in the hands of uh, national border control in this case. How else can we think of nature and nature reserves other than human exclusion zones? When we consider rewilding, what would a new wild look like? considering the various species that inhabit it again, but also the human cultural heritage in the relation to nature and forest. It seems to be a good moment to continue the journey with Gerard Ortin's video reserve. It's about the drastic reduction of, wolf, of the wolf population in the Basque country, Northern Spain in the recent decades. Much like Hannah and Pfizer video, it deals with the changing landscape and the ghosts. And while the previous film was about the ghosts of an orchid, in Gerard's work, the wolf is a ghost character who no longer inhabits the land and that once performed part of it, uh, that once formed part of its territory. Um, The wolf is juxtaposed with footage of hunters and vultures feeding, thinking about who and who cannot be represented in this video. So in Gerard's video, um, we hear a conversation between the artist and um, uh, a US company that sells wolf urines. And Gerard is interested whether buying these wolf urines could potentially help save the lives of wild boars by uh, deterring them to venture too much um, onto the main roads. So basically, um, the wild boar, as well as many other animals present in the landscape, are still um, genetically predetermined to be afraid of um, certain animals, even though they are missing from the landscape. Hence the wolves, and wolf urine can be used as a deterrent um, for certain animals. Um, and you can see a bit of the installation and one of, um, in one of uh, Jared Solutions, he also introduced this product, the wolf urine, also into the exhibition space, um, which had you know, a double effect of both attracting humans and deterring um, other animals in this case. Um, further to thinking about sort of um, how to address ghosts or how to think with or perhaps reestablish certain plants in a forest that have been missing, I want to talk about Maria Teresa Avish's work. She investigates the histories and circumstances of particle 
particular localities within the Amazon rainforest. So to see the forest standing is from 2019. Um, in this exhibition, I presented it as a four channel video and um, it's um, interviews with 34 agroforestry agents in Acre in Brazil. Um, the participants are community leaders who come from various reservations throughout the state of Acre and represent various indigenous peoples or have survived genocidal campaigns on viruses, first by the Portuguese and then the Brazilians. They are uh, responsible to community consensus for managing reforestation. Um, sustenance of farming, overseeing animal life, and protection of um, water sources, among others. So they each talk about how they um, agree. This was a collection box, by the way, for the for the community. In the exhibition, they all talk about how they are guardians of this place, and specifically how and what kind of species they are reforesting. Now, of course, if you think about um, the Amazon rainforest as a place that has been for centuries um, thought about and common kind of together by small tribes that move from place to place to place, but it has on the long term changed the biodiversity of the place. And um, as these um, indigenous leaders also talk about how um, they have developed specific um, relationships with plants and they are trying to plant those useful plants back into the forest um, to ensure sort of the longevity not only of the forest but also their relationship with it or their um, grandchildren's relationship with it because these trees will, will take more than a single human's lifetime to start to really flourish so they really think of the of the forest as both um, cultural as well as natural. Um, just quickly, wanted to talk about a project of petrified forest, um, which is um, really related to a project by Petra Feliansova. I find I start here. So as part of the exhibition, um, this was a collection of photographs. Um, originally, the photographs were an archive that were found on the streets of Budapest and were sent to Petra by a friend. And then she kind of took this archive and rearranged them with sort of a light hand. And really, the, the person who would have collected these photos and would have really, really known what they are all about is now gone. So it's but an archive, a photographic archive of what looks like petrified pieces of wood. So it's really an ancient forest um, that was once decoded by a person, but now that person's gone. And it's only this kind of fragmented memories of a place that could have been and uh, I just like sort of underlined it with a different project. Um, she's a book project I often referenced. Uh, Bad Luck Hot Rocks, which is a um, petrified forest in the um, US, um, where there's this uh, kind of pile of rocks just outside, um, pieces of basically petrified wood that had been returned because people believe that it had brought them bad luck. However, most often those uh, pieces are actually not from this place, um, but, but they might have picked up um, these pieces somewhere else and sort of um, combined in their memory, the memory of visiting this place um, and this rock that may have been in the family for generations or may come from somewhere com and often may come from somewhere completely different. Um, but how like certain objects can carry the memory of a site for a very long time and they can be really linked to family history and in this case, uh, also it's tragedy. 
and then sort of to to end on a note that feels um quite pertinent at the moment um I would like to um, quote artist and researcher Vivian Sansov, which, whom I collaborated um, on a related project which involved her um, Palestine Hems Heirloom Seed Library. This um, seed library looks after um, various genetically uh, specific plants um, from Palestine. Um, obviously, the last um, month and a half has been a very severe situation in Gaza, and Vivian has been posting about it um, several times on Instagram. Um, she writes a accompanying image of centuries old olive trees in Gaza, which are deeply rooted in the landscape. So the context is that since the start of the Israeli offensive on October the 7th, farmers have not been able to access their farmland or crops, and the olive crops have been left on the trees to spoil. So there's no harvest this year. She writes, the trees who for us are not commodities, but family members, we name and we live and we live with, these trees are being torched and destroyed. The people who loved and cared for them are being slaughtered. Maybe this will move some of you to speak out publicly instead of sending shy messages or lukewarm sympathies. We are not fighting for private property or for our rights to bear arms. We are fighting for soil, sun, water and air that has nourished us and our ancestors for centuries. Our trees have bared witness and they are bearing witness. Never forget trees, never forget, trees are where all the spirits go to rest. And like now, our ancestors' sleep is interrupted and their spirits are ignited with rage. Thank you. So these were just um, some ideas, mostly based around this exhibition that I curated for Transit British Love in 2020, but also trying to expand a little bit, um, give some context how my thinking can come from site-specific things or how the research-based um, kind of uh, exhibitions relate to specific sites and some of the ideas travel from site to site, always um, thinking about how sites and people's relationship with site and cultural heritage um, can go together with ecology, how nature and culture um, mutually influence each other. Um, I hope this has been helpful and I hope you have a Lovely rest of the symposium. Thank you. Bye.